This is the Authentic Change Podcast, and I am Mike Horn. Authenticity reflects what we want from each other and our organizations. Open communication, trust, community, fun, and opportunity. I want to help you to do your best in your personal and professional relationships. This podcast delivers expertise, insights, and approaches on authentic leadership. To live your purpose, to lead from your values, to establish connected relationships, to steward people and culture change, to build and sustain prosperity, and to open doors and possibilities. This podcast will assist you in paving the way forward to personal, team, and organizational prosperity. Welcome to this episode of the Authentic Change Podcast with Mike Horn. I am absolutely delighted to have in our studio today, Anastasia Nederson, who is the founder and chief executive officer of Wisno. It's an amazing story that she brings uh, to the audience uh, as a serial entrepreneur with a track record of accomplishment in both software and hardware products and services. I was engaged in a call with Anastasia uh, several weeks ago, and I think what she's doing uh, in terms of Wisnook will be of immediate interest to everyone in the audience as it helps people and culture activities, helps people to build teams, helps to create cultures and community and organizations. And that's what makes me so delighted to have Anastasia, the CEO and co-founder of Wisnook with us today. How about some uh, words, Anastasia? Hi, and thank you so much for having me here. I'm also as equally delighted and excited. Um, I Yes, my background is a very interesting story. I started in the bioengineering and mechanical engineering uh, education, and a lot of my career professional growth has been in biotech industry. Uh, but that all changed when I personally had an experience in the workplace that was um, very challenging for me. Uh, I would say it was a dysfunctional workplace uh, environment, and it created a lot of turmoil in my life, uh, even some health issues. And I think when I kind of discovered opportunities, how to overcome that for myself, it opened up the door to um, a very new world for me, especially as an engineer, um, that um, allowed me to get to the creation of Wisnook tools and this idea of intelligent games that uh, will provide the, the means for the teams to really learn about the dynamic, about the connection within the team, some of the challenges that they face, whether it's communication or um, collaboration and maybe even inquisitiveness, right? Now, kind of how to give opportunities for people to be more creative. Um, so yes, I'm kind of been on this journey and I'm driven by the idea to continuously learning and improving and figuring out ways um, how to find um, talented and creative people that can empower and inspire me. And uh, I'm here to just continue doing my work and see how many people I can um, empower with a uh, Wisnik tool. It's amazing. I, I mean, as a serious engineer, uh, UC Berkeley, uh, a master's of science in mechanical engineering from Santa Clara. You described there was an event in an organization that caused you to uh, dive more deeply into people and culture issues. Are you able to describe that? Yes. Um, and it's it's interesting that a lot of um, people do not feel comfortable to talk about the challenges that they face at work. It's primarily a very silent problem. Uh, and maybe in the more recent years, we start seeing kind of more of it, especially if it's high profile companies, right? And then there would be some kind of litigations. Uh, but yeah, it's starting to come out on the surface. But for the longest time, I think it was a very silent problem. Um, and a lot of employees that were unhappy at work or felt uh, that it was a toxic work environment, they either would just continue at their own detriment and frankly, at the detriment to the company too, because sure. it, um, 
and uh, or they would leave, right? Those are kind of the two options. And majority of people at some point basically just A detriment leave. to the company as well. I mean, given the expense of replacing someone. Absolutely. Um, and so I think that for me, as I start more openly talking about my experience, um, I realized, first of all, how big of a problem that is, that at the minimum, majority of the people in the, stati- the latest statistics is in the 90 percent are not engaged at their work, which means that they just show up, do the kind of the bare minimum to <laughs> and then uh, basically leave their work. But if you think about it, if we spend 90 percent of our time at work and if it's just the means of kind of get by, um, that's not the most healthy or inspiring way to live, right? Um, Especially since humans are at the heart of every enterprise. And we're shifting from you know, a period that I think was more leader-centric and manager-centric now to more individually-centric. I mean, we have a whole history of promoting people based on their technical abilities, not on their leadership abilities. And as we've experienced... Uh, throughout the pandemic, now endemic, really thinking about what it means to be involved and what it means to lead in this time period. I 100% agree. And I I would even add to it that we are much more reliant on this idea of group effort. Because I think in the past, you would have this really talented engineer or this really talented artist or whoever it is, right? Graphic designer. And then you would leverage these skills with, like you said, a strong manager and kind of put this together. I do find that more and more the the level of, the level of complexity of projects that nowadays, you know, we as humanity face uh, requires a very integral and kind of this collective effort. And that does require us to really work together as a group. And I think that um, because we're not really taught in this um, in schools and universities, we kind of get into workplace without necessarily having some of these skills. Um, I think that's what really created a lot of those challenges. And if you think about it from a manager perspective too, how do you become a manager most often nowadays? You good at something you do, and then you get promoted, right? And so, has anybody ever teach you how to be a good manager? And then the next level, there's really good manager, but then there's a really good leader. And those are two very different things, right? Uh, a lot of people confuse the two, but that's um, that's a mistake because a really good manager um, is good at the organizational part of the group and kind of making sure that all the different pieces come together. A good leader can really set this group for the for the pathway for the direction and inspire and then create an environment for this um, for the, for play for curiosity for innovation uh, and for a feeling a sense of purpose. I'm always fond of the expression that managers do things right, leaders do the right things, and you haven't left your left side of your brain yet because with Wisnook. You are providing data-driven team development services, uh, really working on the issues that you've referred to around the lack of engagement, uh, the lack of empowerment that causes people to shift away or to check out in their organizations. So in a way, you do this through gamification and um, awaken a, a spirit or a desire or uh, an instinct that we had as children in order to engage and develop and learn and grow. Can you talk a little bit more about what's behind gamification and how that relates to leadership? Absolutely. So if you really think about how we traditionally approach team development and team building, there are kind of two major buckets. One of them would be a, a more of a fun connection piece and that you know different companies would approach it differently but there would be some kind of social aspect of it a scavenger um, hunt a yeah. cook dinner together Absolutely. sculpt ice together go bowling together right yes yes <laughs> and then there was the other bucket which uh 
was primarily surveys, but there were also trainings, you know, some of those video trainings that you would have to go through, um, potentially workshops, and it kind of these two major buckets. And majority of people that I have known in the workplace definitely did not identify that the bucket of kind of this more development um, as enjoyable, right? And then even in the bucket of the kind of more social fund, it really depends how the company did it, what type of um, group you had. And so I've had definitely uh, experiences in in my life that it was really fun. We would have game nights on every Thursday and we would just laugh and enjoy ourselves. What I discovered, and I was a manager at that point, that even when the group socially feels very connected during these off time kind of events, it did not translate necessarily towards that uh, cohesive and um, working together well team. And so, especially if it was a really cross functional team, lots of dependencies, ownership, but at the same time, you know, working collaboratively, right? That there's that balance of the two. And so for me, I think the, the idea with Wisnook and the gamification was really how do you bridge those two? How do you create an environment that's socially fun and easy and right. helpful, but we do get that information and we get the opportunities to uh, both instigate certain behaviors in the game environment, um, but also collect data, collect what are the, some of the innate um, social norms and dynamic within the group that potentially um, blocking its true potential and not allowing it to really improve. And then one more thought that I was thinking specifically about surveys, um, we fill them out with our analytical mind, right? We have our biases, we have our perceptions, and with that idea, we've answered the questions. And even the most clever uh, surveys can be potentially hacked by a person who really thinks through what are they trying to get to and skew the data, right? Right. Um, Whereas behaviors are much, much more challenging to, um, obviously there could be good actors. (laughs) Sure. People who intentionally behave in a certain way. But most often, if we're just left to ourselves and if the game especially is... um, simulating a little bit of a challenge there's agency there is a timer so it will run out and the game you know you lose there's kind of this agency to let go of this analytical mind and be in the process be in the game and really work with your team to to do this activity and so really the thought for me was um there's an opportunity to really tap into what's really going on versus what we think is going on I don't know if you right. see and it seems that uh, what you're doing at Wisnook, though, is not only taking that, you know, what we know from behavioral psychology and team dynamics, but you're backing your analytics with some advanced AI technology. How, tell me how that works and, um, you know, what that means uh, practically for the practitioner, someone might, who might be a consumer of gamification. Uh, yep. services, maybe an HR person, an organization development colleague, a consultant, a coach? Yeah, definitely. So think about the data. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, analytics of the data and some companies actually approaching analyzing email or Slack data. Sure, yes. The difference between Wisnook and these different approaches, which initially we started kind of playing with that um, concept, we found quickly that there is no context to the data, which means that your signal of data is relatively low. And so you need, first of all, a lot of data to find those patterns and um, the accuracy may all still not be there. But if you have a game and you know what the goal of the game is, right? you know what the team is intended to do, you track the information they get, what type of hints, what type of secrets, what type of uh, directions. And on top of it, you distribute the information, which means certain information one person has, another person has another piece of information and the pieces, the puzzles. And so then it really gives you an opportunity to track how the communication happens. From the moment you receive your first clue 
to whether you communicated to your team, whether the team received it, whether there was a successful outcome of that. And so this was really where I think the novelty and the beauty of the tool that we've created, because it really allows us to track that communication uh, in an environment that um, uh, very much was designed to for that collaborative nature and to create situations where um, team dynamic was more likely to um, show up. So as I understand it, I mean, in part, uh, the game is really more like an escape room uh, type of experience that many of us have had with friends, family members, you placed in a room, a limited set of clues, you try to figure it out. I don't think I've ever succeeded with a group of people, (laughs) but we've always enjoyed it. And I think I've learned something about uh, each other in that process. Is that one of the components um, or primary component of Wisnook Technologies? Yes. And and we obviously looking into other games as well. Sure. Apron. But yes, uh, if you think about specifically this current product, is that there's different levels. And so different levels kind of focus on the different type of um, behaviors. And so, uh, for example, in the second level, we have opportunities for failure, and it's done intentionally. And we analyze with our um, an- analytics in the back end, the communication before and after the failure attempt. And this is how we measure the metric called resilience. And so the teams that have a failure event and they change their communication to be less engaged, maybe there's sentiment analysis, which is how positive or negative the communication is. Maybe their sentiment decreased and they kind of, that would be an indication of lower resistance score. If the opposite, they are much more kind of eager and there's that passion and there's um, exclamation of excitement in their communication. And we pick up on this in our analytics, then they get a resiliency score of higher. And what's even more interesting, we found now that we've had many teams go through our um, gamified activity tool, um, that we see that particular score, resiliency score, is a really strong indicator in general how the team is. And yes, we put together all these other metrics, but we find that that certain metrics are kind of have even more stronger indication. And um, it's is it a synchronous event for a team? Does everybody have to be online at the same time playing the game? Or is it you know, here's my input and I'll see you tomorrow. (laughs) Yes, in order to really to pick up on this dynamic, we do require uh, a synchronous, uh, you know, event. Uh, We do look into other options. Again, we want to offer a platform of these different gamified activities for different uh, purposes. Purposes. So this one is really strong in an assessment, but we also look in into small, small and shorter games that will kind of in place of a um, morning hub, right? Like some groups get together and they have like um, agile style type of um, work, but they could also do like a 15 minute type of activity that energizes them, that focuses on the very particular elements that will help them throughout the day. And so we're really looking at these different aspects of um, everyday workplace and what would be helpful to the teams to stay with this um, and keep practicing. Kind of like, I don't know, if have you used the apps for, I don't know, daily meditation? Sure. Opportunity for all sorts of flavors and you can choose what works for you um, on a daily basis. So this is really gamification for at a whole new level for folks uh, in the workplace and for people and culture leaders who are looking for different um, opportunities to develop their folks. Um, This isn't the days of gamification being displayed as a series of videos you watch, complete the question box, and maybe get some feedback at the end. This is uh, a synchronous event using some higher um, uh, powered intelligence. Um, so how do you go about doing all the research for this? Because I imagine in this immersive gameplay, I mean, you're doing some amazing things to help a team understand, uh, about a fast and clear communication, uh, listening with intent and compassion, 
igniting their creativity, laughing together, committing, sharing mistakes, all the things. How, how are you combining? You've got some data from the team, plenty of data in terms of how they interact. I assume some pre-meeting questionnaire or survey that provides data about the team. Tell me about where you're blending and how you're blending in other sources of data. Mm-hmm. No, so basically, uh, as of now, when the team plays this activity, we go through the report together yes. and we really focus on some elements that they can start uh, what we call an intervention, right? There's an areas and we have recommendations of what specifically they can start focusing on. But we also partnering with um, professionals in the space, team coaches, team developing companies, and where they really can kind of take this uh, and then create a program for intervention um, to continue working with the with the team and figure out ways how to, um, yeah, make progress. And then Wisdom Games could be used as a way to keep coming back to the data. Let's say you measured how your team did, you implemented certain change, and then you did another game to then measure what is the progress. Did the team improve? Has you know what? Maybe there's something new came, uh, especially if the team composition changed a little bit, right? And there could have been new um, team members that joined the group. And uh, there's opportunities to reflect on has that changed the dynamic? What I love about the Wisdom products and services is uh, a reference that's made that when you step into a Wisdom um, experience, it's often like a sleep lab. Can you explain a little more? People aren't going to sleep at work, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. It was a reference that my co-founder really likes to to use, but this idea that um, it's think of it more of as a simulation rather than a game, um, because I think especially the decision makers with the, within the companies, the CEOs, the executive team, um, they not necessarily would be open. Oh, like let's have everybody play games, right? There's um, the simulation is uh, offers this idea that you create an environment where you and the sleep lab reference is really about that you are there's an ability to recognize what is actually wrong at the core and what are some of the um, data that we can then reference and so yes maybe not everybody can understand that reference um, I like to use actually reference for um, when you go to the doctor and you do a blood test. And so for us, the report that we get after the blood, uh, which is similar to that blood test, that there's a bunch of metrics, there's a bunch of uh, references on ranges, um, but you still need somebody to interpret it and kind of figure out well, what to do with this data, right? And so um, that's kind of some of the reference that I like to use, that sometimes we do a whole comprehensive panel, sometimes we do like a shorter, small test on a particular metric, and that's what those other games will be, that we can be able to measure very, very particular things that to, to track whether the um, team's making progress or not. Well, and as I understand, the focus is on three broad areas and then some themes underneath those broad areas. So the broad areas of communication, innovation, and collaboration. Mm-hmm. And within communication, we might be talking about styles, response times, motivation, in collaboration, perhaps around uh, resilience, as you point out, mm-hmm. uh, coordination, innovation, thinking about what propels the success of every enterprise. Mm-hmm. Um, as you focus on these, how does this relate to the leadership experience? Uh, clearly, these are all things that we look for in mm-hmm. leaders to h- inspire people to uh, innovate, to collaborate, and communication at the base of that. So as you think about leadership generally within the team and in the uh, meetings that your clients and you facilitate, how does that come, how does the topic of leadership arise? So for me, I think the, the, the biggest thing for leaders that are, let's say, participating in, the, in, in Wisdom uh, Intelligent Games is that not only they will be able to see visually uh, the communication pattern within the group, and they will see, first of all, their position, but that they also be able to see if there's uh, clicks forming within the group, if there is somebody who is a little bit isolated from the group. And so as a leader, there's definitely opportunities for reflection and understanding, oh, how can we create a more inclusive uh, group 
where it's just more dis- well distributed communication pattern. Uh, another thing that I think would be interesting for leaders is this idea of not hierarchical um, approach that you mentioned earlier that that's was kind of the the theme in the past that you have the sub, you know the leader and then the subordinates, but really owe the results of the team as a leader as your own. So there is no differentiation between the leader and the people in his uh, group. Instead, we we kind of come as this collective entity. And then so there's this, as a leader, because you're probably more invested in the health of this group than maybe individuals in this group. Then that's, I think, the takeaway is taking all these different metrics that we collect and finding ways how to create that um, entity now that can really be empowered and creative and uh, inspiring. Yes. So you're able to provide um, through this, um, through this, uh, through your approaches uh, and through the game itself, some network analysis of uh, communication. And certainly that's always been an important part of organization development. Um, And a lot of it was not, readily being used until you know rob cross came along again and started uh, a lot of work with uh, network analysis uh, social network analysis in organizations and i wonder as you as your clients receive the information and the discovery around network analysis how that affects and impacts uh the group I think it provides a, a, a very visual kind of uh, graph level, um, an opportunity to understand what potentially is um, not working so well in the group. And then if the team is actually is very cohesive, then to celebrate, hey, we are really well um, communicating and working together and collaborating. So I think... For me, a network analysis graph, especially when you start looking at different teams and how different they are, um, and that's actually one of the goals for Wisnik is as we get to thousands of teams, then we really will start to figure out some optimal patterns, right? Um, and not just from research and science, but now from our own data and from our own um, knowledge. But uh, but because we started the the this game and the design of the game, obviously basing it on a lot of uh, solid research, but we want to take that as a base, and then at some point we want to discover something through our analytics, through our um, way of approaching kind of this collective intelligence concept, and start looking at not just as the core teams that play these games, but also at an organizational level. So think about a large corporation, and that's for the sake of this um, conversation, you know, a thousand employees, for example. Let's say these a thousand employees played our games at individual core teams level. That is great. They, they have the information. They can do certain things to um, work towards uh, improving their individual core teams. But what about analyzing cross-functionally across all of those teams and start looking at the health of this collective organization. And that's super fascinating for me and our team. Uh, and we would like to get there. We would like to start providing to these corporations uh, what do we, what our analytics pick up on that organizational collective intelligence. Amazing. And you know that uh, my focus is primarily on helping people to bring who they are to what they do, to bring their best to situations and uh, to lead authentically. And as I, you know, have thought about authentic leadership, relationships and trust are really at the heart of an authentic uh, leadership experience so that communication occurs, um, innovation thrives, collaboration uh, ensues, all of the elements that you're helping and seeking to uh, helping groups to understand and and seeking to develop more of a knowledge base in these areas. Um, That's good work to do. And as 
you think about authentic leadership and the value of relationships and the value of um, uh, of respecting others, to placing value in the individual, to understanding that individuals are in a process of development. Um, how does that, does that experience ever manifest itself in the work that you do? Um, do people, uh, do leaders come to, how do leaders come to deeper levels of understanding about that? Because leadership is generally resistant to training, I believe. <laughs> you know, the kind of training that you, you describe, generally resistant. Yes. And I think what, what I'm learning through the work that I do is that even if there's that resistance, um, there's an opportunity to provide a different kind of take on something that potentially, especially, you know, leaders that have been in, in their professional life in this position for a long time, and they really feel um, kind of uh, solidified in this space and that they know what they're doing, right? They have this kind of, um, in a way, in a way, rigid kind of thinking, right? And so I think that um, when we have an opportunity to provide something that sparks that aha moment for them, that they, oh, like I, I didn't think about this or this didn't make sense to me, but now it does or something like this. Then there's that that opening that I believe is very important because it elevates their consciousness to the next level, right? So they're now in the space of uh, kind of curiosity and discovery. And then in that field, in that space, now there's a really opportunity to uh, for both learning, but also implementation of cha- making a change. Because when you're in the space of like rigidity, it's very difficult to make any changes because you think that you're doing everything right. And, and that's actually where also a lot of leaders fall in the trap of if there's something wrong, it's somebody else's fault, right? Right. <laughs> yes. Um, Blame flows downhill. And that, you know, it's really the antithesis. I mean, that would be the antithesis of authentic leadership. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's where it starts. It starts kind of in, in the moment of that self-reflection where there's, a, it could be a small, but it's an opening. And then um, from that place, then you can really uh, make some meaningful changes. It's amazing uh, work that you're doing with the, uh, these uh, services and products. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, our audience would like to find out more at Wiznook. That's W-H-I-Z-N-O-O-K dot com. Tell me the origin story of the name too. What, yes, <laughs> what know, is a Wiznook? <laughs> I know it's a little odd. I mean, nowadays you want it to be short and kind of easy. To, right. At the same time, you want a little, some meaning for founders. It's important to kind of, because it is our seed and that our, I don't know if some people call sure. it. Um, so for, for me, it was really about kind of play on words of whiz, which is like a wizard or somebody sure. really, really smart, intelligent, right? So the kind of this collective intelligence, think of intelligence, but in the word of whiz. Um, and nuke, kind of this idea of group coming together. Again, play the words of this collective intelligence in a very different um, word. Um, I know that, you know, not for everybody, this meaning will come through right away, or maybe not ever. But yes, uh, for, for us, for my team, that's really kind of what we align with is this idea that we can be stronger in a group and that intelligence and talent and really uniqueness that we have really shines through when we come together as a group. Yeah. And it is briefer or shorter than smart people coming together. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Uh, And I could see, um, you know, given the interest I've always had in data analytics and uh, creating, uh, I think the first people analytics function, in the pharmaceutical industry in the United States, given that I've always had a deep interest in uh, analytics, I'm wondering, as you move forward uh, with Wisnook, I I imagine that there is a great attraction um, to engineers, to scientists, uh, to using these tools. Um, What other groups uh, value, uh, gain value? I mean, I imagine it could be a, a group of uh, folks on a factory floor, a group of um, uh, teammates uh, working in a coffee shop, uh, uh, almost in any circumstance, 
Yeah, some of the more unique ones that um, came to us were um, families. Families, so yes. Kind of interesting because then measuring the dynamics within the family um, is a very obviously new vertical. Uh, that's not something we actively pursue doing, but um, more than happy to support families that want to do this activity and learn about the dynamics within a family. Well, it's very much like a, a lot of uh, my coaching clients, quite a few of my coaching clients come to me as individuals, not mm-hmm. sponsored by their corporations for lots of different reasons. You know, the career change uh, that they don't really want to talk about in their organization and still need help with, mm-hmm. um, perhaps a personal improvement goal. So, you know, again, I love the variety of uh, verticals that you can approach. And that would certainly be a unique one for this <laughs> nook to work with families. Yes. Um, but also uh, academia, we've had uh, definitely universities that approach us, um, insurance companies, medical. Actually, the, we, one of the clients, it was a um, cohort of the residents. And so they have a camp, I think, it lasts several weeks and they uh, in, in basically wanted to implement the WISNO prior to the starting of the cohort and then afterwards, kind of as the bookends of this um, intensive program that they have. So very, very different verticals. Uh, we obviously not, you know, closing our doors to anybody, uh, but we recognize that probably more tech companies are much more likely to implement something like this. And so that's uh, the direction we kind of more easily flowing into. But yes, uh, like I said, in our experience, very different types of uh, verticals um, been uh, of interest. And so who knows, maybe we'll pivot and we'll focus on families. (laughs) But it really, I mean, what you're doing, I mean, with these intelligent games, the Wisnok intelligent games, is you are um, really working at um, at the next generation of uh, team development um, that given, you know, the kinds of twists that can come, uh, the analytics that you provide, for many, I mean, this represents the future of team development. No, I appreciate that. And that's how I like to look at it as well. That's what motivates me. That's what gets me up in the morning. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So as we wrap up, uh, Anastasia, if people wanted to get in touch with uh, Wisno, how would they do that? Yes, I think the easiest would be to connect with me directly. It's Anastasia at Wisnook.com. And also there you can look at our website. There is a contact uh, form there that you can um, put your contact information into. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on social media. So I'm fairly easily to find. I think even if you search Anastasia Nederson, uh, I'd be the first person to show up. So (laughs) I'm (laughs) going to be uh, I'm more than happy to have conversations. We can do, you know, demos uh, or uh, any type of materials that could be helpful. And um, yeah, I'm excited to hear feedback too, and um, just in general ideas in the space. So Wiznook, W-H-I-Z-N-O-O-K.com. Uh, that's uh, probably one of the best ways uh, to get in touch or directly with Anastasia at A N A. S-T-A-S-I-A at wisnook.com uh, to communicate and be in touch with her uh, directly. This has been an absolutely um, fascinating uh, conversation for me, Anastasia. And if you were to offer one piece of guidance or advice as we close mm-hmm. to people wanting better futures with their team, what would that be? piece of advice or guidance be? And I, I know that can be a difficult question because there usually isn't one best solution when it comes to team development, but what would be one of your pieces of advice or pieces of guidance? Um, don't be afraid to be vulnerable. Hmm. Because I think we have just from early on are trained never to show that you're weak. Always kind of have this demeanor that we always in control. Um, but I do think that authenticity that you refer to a lot it really comes down from a place of vulnerability too and sure because we're all humans and i think people respond to vulnerability they soften to vulnerability and there's really a, a beautiful beautiful place of creation from a place mm-hmm. of vulnerability yeah and all, uh, learning who we are self-awareness so key to uh leading people and cultures authentically i've been so delighted to uh 
have Anastasia Nederson in our studio today. It's uh, been a gr- great delight for me to um, have this conversation and for our audience uh, to be introduced to Wisnook and to Anastasia Nederson, uh, the CEO and founder co- uh, of Wisnook. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time today and to our audience until the next episode of the Authentic Change Podcast. Stay well. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. And I hope you'll subscribe today and tell a friend about our show. If you're looking for hands-on help to increase your success through authentic change or have a question you'd like to hear me answer here, please email me at mike at mike-horn, H-O-R-N-E dot com.